Good morning. Thanks for coming today. Let's pray. Lord, thank you that you love us. Thank you for your great compassion. Thank you for your comfort. Lord, we do pray for your comfort in our lives in so many areas. And Lord, not just for ourselves, but that as you comfort us, we can comfort others with the comfort we've received from you. The Lord, you would help us to remember that you are strength. And Lord, right now we ask you to speak very, very personally, remind us of people, remind us of things so personally that we can't miss it, that we'll know exactly what you said and what we should do. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Be seated. <clears throat> Today we're talking about, we've been talking about simplicity, and we're talking about the simplicity of witness today. I can remember when I was a uh, much younger pastor, nearly um, 40 years ago. Actually, when I was first came to the Lord, you know, the Lord um, changed my life and brought me out of some really tough stuff. And I was just so excited, so happy to be free of that. And so, so hopeful that I just would just talk to people about the Lord. You know, I mean, I wasn't thinking about it and nobody really said, oh, you need to do this. It was just kind of the overflow of my life. You know, it was going on. And it's kind of like when you're excited about something. Well, like it's like for some of you, when you're mad about something, you're always talking about it. <laughs> but when you're excited about something, happy about something, you'll talk about it too. So I was happy and, and talking about it. But you know, one of the things... I've noticed in life, there's a lot of bad things that can happen when we ignore the original instructions. There really is. And, and I think that when it comes to really witnessing to other people and reaching other people and trying to talk to other people about the Lord, there's just, sometimes we just ignore the original instructions. And what happened in my life is people, I, I was a Christian and I was just talking to people and, and sharing my faith with people. And then some people got a hold of me and they were well intended, but they decided they were going to train me. They're going to train me how to do this the right way. According to, and I, I can't even tell you folks, I mean, in both in Bible college and in uh, seminary and in church and in pastoring. I probably have a stack of books that tall on the notebooks on classes and how to witness and what to do and all this stuff. And now I look back on it and I think most of that was not listening to the original instructions. As a matter of fact, most of the, um, did you know that an interesting, a little interesting thing that maybe you didn't know, but did you know that you, what do you think the percentage of people that actually become Christians and really walk with God, what do you think the percentage, the total percentage of, of all believers that end up in church, living for God, what is the percentage of people that came to Jesus because of mass evangelism, television, preachers, Christian radio, um, satellite networks, um, uh, air, you know, dropping leaflets, whatever, all these mass evangelism approaches. You know what the total number of people that end up really serving God? Over years, they've been tracking this. Obviously, they track it because not only do they want to know if it works, but there's a lot of money on the table in this stuff. You know what the total, what, what do you think the number is? Any guesses? 2%? What's that? 2.5? Oh, this is like, this is like a, game show here that's going under one percent depending on who you talk to it's somewhere between one like two tenths of one percent and nine nine tenths of a percent do you know how people actually really come to faith same way you did most of you you had a friend you had a grandma 
some neighbor picked you up and took you, so your Boy Scout leader or your, or maybe it was your parents took you and they told you about the Lord or you had a friend you went to school with or, or you were in rehab and somebody was a Christian and they, they, uh, they told you about Jesus and invited you to church. And, uh, and it may have been a long journey. And even people, this is where it breaks down, even people that say they got converted at a Billy Graham crusade or they were watching some dude on TV, when you really drill down in it, you find out that there was somebody who was actually sharing the Lord with them before that ever happened. You understand what I'm saying? The way God works is through you, through people. It's just simple stuff, just through one life to another. It's life to life resuscitation. That's what it is. But we make things so complicated. I've often wondered, how do all these millions and millions of dollars, these big machines and all this publishing and all the stuff that I had to go through, how does that stuff even you know, you probably did it too when you were in school. You had to take like all these tracks and stuff. And I even taught some of this stuff. And now I look back on it and I think, I think it's just a, you know, you know, they, there's been a lot of conversations about it. A lot of it comes from, a lot of times Christians, we're, this can be good or bad. We're adapters, right? And so some, something comes out of the marketplace, like Wall Street, like how to sell, like a, how to sell you know, cars. And people think, well, if you can get people to buy a car, I bet we could get people to buy Jesus. Maybe not buy Jesus, but at least sign on for Jesus. And so what ends up happening is, whether we realize it or not, we, uh, we begin to approach witness as like trying to sell someone a four-wheel drive plan of salvation. The problem is, it doesn't work but it does make a lot of money for people. And it does keep those cards and letters flowing. The reality is, is you know how God's, what God's plan, the simple plan for God to bring people to, the, to Christ, to witness, to share the witness of Christ? You know what the simple plan is? I know it's scandalous. It doesn't sound like a good idea, but here it is, it's you. It's that simple, just you, just, just plain old you, not a perfect you, inconsistent you, grumpy you, um, weird you. <laughs> oh, you know, we, get, we make things so complicated, don't we? And the outcome is, is when the more complicated things, what happens to you when something gets really complicated? What do you tend to do? You're just like, I, I, I don't know if I want to do that. I got this thing. I ordered it on Amazon. It was like a cart. And it came. It had like 200 pieces. I literally almost just had them come pick it up. And I think that's the way a lot of us are about this kind of stuff. It gets so complicated. You know, the early disciples wanted to make things complicated too. And they were curious, kind of like we are. Curiosity is a good thing. But sometimes our curiosity can d get us off track, get us off what we really need to be, be focused on. And so the early disciples, they wanted Jesus to, hey, tell us how the world's going to play out. All these nations and power and, and all the political intrigues of the age and how you're going to wrap it all up, Jesus. They asked him straight up, when are you going to do all this? How's this going to play out? And here's what Jesus said to him, because this is important. Jesus tells us there are some things you don't need to be worrying about. There's some things you don't need to focus on. But I got news for you. We focus on it an awful lot. But the problem is, is when you're focused on the wrong thing, you aren't focused on the right thing. And so here's what Jesus says. And they were wanting, hey, when's the end of the age going to happen? When are you going to come back? And when is all this going to come down? Here's what Jesus said. It is not for you to know the times or epochs that the Father has fixed by his own authority. Jesus is basically saying this. I don't want you focusing on this. Now, I know that if you read Left Behind 343, um, you, 
you know those guys made a lot of money. I actually met a lot of those guys, like Hal Lindsey, all those guys. Here's the one thing they all have in common. They were all wrong. <laughs> because we don't know the times or the seasons that Jesus is going to come back exactly. We don't. If we get all focused on that. I mean, I was around in 88. 88 reasons why Jesus is coming in 88 only to be followed up by a less popular book, 89 reasons why he's coming in 89. And then 99 reasons why he was coming in 99, that was kind of a flop, but for obvious reasons. You know, there's a diminishing return on these extravagant titles. I'm just trying to tell you this. He says, this is a simple, this is not a Greek, complicated Greek construct. It is not for you to know the times and epics which the Father has fixed by his own authority. But here's what you need to focus on. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. That's pretty great. Focus on that. And you shall be my witnesses, both in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and the remotest parts of the earth. And after he had said these things, he was lifted up while they were looking on, and a cloud received him out of their sight. Isn't that amazing? The last thing he said obviously was pretty important, and they took the gospel and witnessed all over the known world, all went to the, every area of the world. We don't even know how far they got, and guess what? How did they do it? They had no internet. They had no satellites. They didn't even have a printing press. They didn't, how did, how did they pull this off? No TV channels. And yet they did it one person at a time. What is a witness? Jesus says, you shall be witnesses. What's a witness? A witness is basically, um, it's, a, it's anyone who will simply tell as best you can, as honestly as you can, your own experience. You don't have to have all the answers. You don't need to be able to answer all the theological quandaries or all of the, all of the apologetics, the, the stacks of apologetics, and you don't have to convince all the atheists of why you're smarter than they are. All you have to do is bear witness to the fact that something amazing has happened in your life. It changed your life. It's made all the difference. That's all a witness is. You don't have to be an expert witness even. Matter of fact, I think a lot of times the age of expertise has caused us all a lot of grief. There's a lot of people that know a tiny little bit about just the one thing and they don't know much about everything else. Here's what God says. Something every one of you can be great at, knowing yourself and sharing it in your experience with God. So how do we witness? Well, I'm going to give you three things the Bible says. They're very simple. These are three simple things, three simple witnesses that are very, very basic to the Christian life. There's all these other things that you hear about, but these three are basics. Number one, baptism, water baptism. This is a very basic step of faith. You give your life to Christ, you receive Christ as your Lord and Savior, and then you publicly bear witness of, of that Jesus died and was buried and rose from the grave, and your life has been, been buried with him in the likeness of his death, and you've been raised to walk, and you have a whole new life, and you're saying it publicly out in front of everybody, water baptism. Actually, the word Baptize is really not an English word. It's a transliterated word. It means baptizo or bapto. It means to, to dunk or to immerse someone. It's a picture of a burial. The early church did this. They had some. So then those who had received his word, so they were being, all these people were sharing. Then Peter gets up and preaches. All that had received his word, they received the message of the gospel, were baptized. And that day, there were added about 3,000 souls. That's a big baptism. I mean, we've had pretty big ones, like 30 or so, but not 3,000. But the reality is, is that people get witness to one at a time. That's how it works. You know, those early um, 
Christians had a lot of interesting baptismal traditions. You know, one of the ones, that there's still a little bit of it around. Back in the day when everybody wore dresses, that's a joke, okay? You know, they wore tunics, longer tunics, that people would, um, people would uh, take off their old outer tunic, they'd get baptized, and then when they came out of the water, one side of the stream or the lake or the ocean, their friends and family would put a new suit of clothes on them. And that was a picture of, oh, the old life has been put off, new life has come. It was one of those things that they did along with baptism. Another interesting thing that you find from the writings in the church of the second century, when people would come out of the ocean, when they baptized them in the ocean, they would put a spoon of honey in their mouth and a little bit of milk to, as a symbol that they've come to the promised land. The other thing that's interesting, did you know that um, uh, in many traditions, when people get baptized as believers, and of course this was added to other liturgical traditions, people be baptized, they get a new name when they're baptized. And so that's where the idea of what's your Christian name. So like if your name was, you know, Zeus, they would get a Christian name. Like, for example, like John, anybody named John here? Any Johns? No Johns? One John? No, there's John. Yeah, that's right. So John. John. And, and why does Christian name matter or name matter? Because names mean, in the West, we tend to think of names as just a label. We like the label. Why did why'd your parents name you that? You know? Oh, they just like the sound of it. But in most societies, that's not how they name people. They name people based on nature. So do you know, John, you know what John, John means? You're going to like it. Beloved of God. Yeah, it's not bad. Now, if your name is Billy Bob, I don't know what the biblical translation of Billy Bob is. I'm sure it's, uh, it's something. <laughs> uh, I shouldn't have went there. Anyway, uh, whoo, this is my third time through this. Okay, let's go home. Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, you know the amazing thing about witness is witness just happens one at a time you're a f you're, you know somebody you talk to them about your experience something that changed your life something you're happy about you know people get witnessed to one at a time people get saved one at a time people get baptized even though there was 3,000 people they all had to be baptized one at a time and people end up growing in the relationship with Jesus one person at a time. There's no real shortcut. There's no magical, mechanical, industrialized way to reach people. You just do it like you do, one relationship at a time, just like you're doing. But there's a second word related to being a witness. It's called this, friendship. That's right. Be a friend. To people. Hey, let me give you a little advice. This is looking over the long term in my experience. Thinking about you back there too. All right? When you give your life, if you're, don't get rid of all your bad friends. <laughs> whatever that means, whatever a bad friend is, or all, all your old friends. Just get stronger. And more like Jesus. Don't get rid of them all. They need you. You know, I know some of you are thinking, oh, no, don't say that. You know, my friends, if I hang out with them, I'll, I'll relapse or whatever. Be smart about it. But don't write them all off. Don't cut them off. You know, I talked about this in the early service. You know Dave Griffiths? Dave was, you know, Dave Griffiths was one of the very few people that were here when I came like 30, almost 39 years ago. And um, Dave was telling me how he came to know the Lord. He said he'd been coming to this little church back when we met down, down the way. And uh, Dave said, Dave was kind of a rough guy. He was a biker, you know, and he was, he was kind of a, living on the, on the, out there by Bobby and Maxine, you know. And, and so they'd been invite the neighbors, they had invited him to church and they were coming to church but Dave was not budging and he was like he knew he needed to give his life to the Lord but he just wouldn't quite do it well 
he told me how he came to the Lord. He went and visited this guy, a friend of his in Seattle, where he was from, and the guy had built a trike. You know what a trike is? It's like a, it had a Volkswagen motor on it, and then it was a tripod, and then it had a, had a, like a sidecar on it. So the guy says, hey, Dave, let's, let me take you for a test drive. Well, they got on the freeway early in the morning, and the guy took it up to like 120. And Dave said, I was in this sidecar right over the, one of these big wheels on the back of it. Do you know what those things look like? And Dave said, I literally thought I was going to die and go to hell. He really said, I did. I mean, I really thought I was done for. And I told God, God, I'm, that's it. I'm all in. This is it. I'm coming to you, Jesus. He said, next Sunday, wild horses couldn't have kept him from coming forward, okay? And I tell you that whole story. He says, 50 years later, guess who came and visited me this week? My old friend that built the trike. And he said, the guy said, hey, let's go out and party, you know? They're like 50 years later, and they're both like almost 80. And he goes, no, let me tell you what happened in my life. Do you remember that trike that you built? He said, you were an instrument of God. <laughs> uh, I say all that because Dave had this great chance to share with this guy, but even though he changed his life, he stayed friends with him. You see? He didn't give up on his friend. Just become more like Jesus. Don't get rid of him. You know why Jesus, the people who hated Jesus the most, they were the religious crowd. And you know why they hated him? They hated him for being the friend of sinners. And they would say stuff like this. You know, if Jesus was really a man of God, he wouldn't hang out with people like that. You know, this happens to me sometimes, too. I get criticized. Like yesterday, I did a, a funeral service. It was kind of, I guess it was a funeral service. It was, uh, my friend's dad died, and they had this service. And I'd known it, his dad, and he'd come to church here. He was an old fisherman. They had the service in like a, I don't know what it is, VFW hall or something. And th this was a, th they were a little bit gnarly, let's just say. But then they like, my friend says, okay, this is my friend. We've known each other for, since high school. He's going to give a little talk, play a song. So I just laid it out, man. I just played the banjo. It was like mowing down fields of wheat. And um, what I'm trying to say is, but, you know, there's always going to be somebody that say, you know, Pastor Joe, if he was really a Christian, he wouldn't go to a place like that or he wouldn't be in a place like that. Hey, I'm telling you what, I like those people. I want to see him come to know the Lord. You know, I, I, some of the stories they told about stuff, I, it was amazing. I'm just trying to tell you that Jesus was oftentimes, and I hear this happen a lot of times too. People say, if that preacher was a, the right kind of guy, he wouldn't, he, wouldn't, uh, he wouldn't be on the same platform with this other person. I totally disagree with that. As long as that person's true to the gospel. Remember what they said about Jesus? Jesus even brought this up. He said, this is their criticism of me. They say, the son of man has come eating and drinking. You say, behold, a gluttonous man, a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Aren't you glad that Jesus is a friend of sinners? For those of you that didn't answer, I just want to say, you ought to be. <laughs> So how can you lovingly share your life witness with people if you are never around people that you disagree with? You know, some of you get like this. You get like this. You get your life. You live in an echo chamber, and you don't mean to. A lot of Christians do this. You go to conferences to listen to people who already agree with everything you think. You... Um, you go, your friends, all, you, you're, all your friends online, they all agree with everything you think. You don't, if, you don't, if you don't agree with them, um, you, um, you never hang around people unless they think like you, vote like you, talk like you, look like you. You never, 
You can never influence people. You can never witness to people unless you're around them. Unless you're around people that don't believe like you or think like you or, or, or maybe act like you. How are you going to have any impact on them? You know, the Apostle Paul chose to be a friend of people no matter where he happened to find them. And that is a pretty tough sell for Paul. You've got to remember, think of the most legalistic, uptight um, person, religious person you've ever met. And Paul would be way worse. I mean, think about this. Paul was, Paul not only didn't like, un, un, he didn't, not only didn't like Gentiles, Paul didn't even like most Jews because they weren't strict enough. He was raised a, a Pharisee. What was Paul doing when he got converted? Do you remember? What was he doing? That's hardcore. He was, he got, he didn't, wasn't just content to hang around Jerusalem and and round up Jews that were believing in Jesus, he had to go get special papers so he could get go out of town and hunt them down and have them imprisoned and executed. That's, that's hardcore. Then, of course, he meets Jesus on the way, and Jesus shows him what a knucklehead he is, <laughs> how blind he is, what a sinner he is how he was absolutely sure, just like you, you are and I have been at many times, absolutely sure he was right of his cause and right of his thinking and right of his culture, right of his religious ideas. And Jesus shows him, no, one thing, we're all, one thing about you, Paul, is you're wrong about all of it. And so Paul has, he's humbled. And what does he end up doing? He, this guy who is this hardcore, he ends up being the, the witness to the Gentiles. Yeah, them. And here's what he says. He writes to the Corinthians. For though I am free from all men, I have made myself a slave to all so that I may win more. To the Jew I become as a Jew so that I might win Jews. To... Um, to those who are under the law as those under the law, though not being myself under the law so that I might win those who are under the law. To those, you see, he just said, I'm not going to make that the main thing. I just want to get him to Jesus. To those who are without the law as without the law, though not being without the law, but the law of God, but under the law of Christ, so that I might win those who are without the law. To the weak, I become weak, then I might win the weak. I have become all things to all men, so that I may by all means save some. I do all things for the sake of the gospel, so that I may become a fellow partaker of it. Isn't it interesting how free he was? Paul was saying, I'm not going to go do things in the culture of my Jewish friends that's going to get in the way, that's trip them up, I, because I want to be able to talk talk about the most important thing, what Jesus has done in my life. I'm not going to get balled up in the politics of Judaism or the politics of the Roman Empire. I'm just, I don't want to get into that. Uh, to the Gentiles, I'll sit down and eat with them too. And to the weak, I'm going to relate to them and have compassion on them. They weak. What does that mean, weak? Maybe they're people that are struggling or they're morally struggling or whatever. I'm going to be, I'm going to be with them. I'm going to relate to them. Paul remembered Jesus' words. Do you remember this, this passage, Jesus' words? These words are hard for us to hear outside of the interpretation of the last 150 years of Christianity in the West that has been heavily influenced by the missionary movement, which wasn't bad. But sometimes we get a very, very, what I call myopic understanding of it. Remember this passage? Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Now, I had three and a half years of Greek when I was in school. I'd like to tell you that I'm an amazing Greek scholar. I'm not. But the other side is most of the people I know, most of the Greek, the only Greek they know runs a delicatessen. So, um, but what I'm trying to tell you is, I know enough about Greek to understand something that often gets overlooked, and that is this, what's called the middle voice. 
This is not in an imperative. This is written in the middle voice. So this is a good translation, by the way. If you go back a verse, if you would for a second, go back one slide. Go therefore. Did you know the best way you could, you lose a little bit of translation because it doesn't include the middle voice. The middle voice really is saying this. As you're going, make disciples. You understand what I mean? As you're going along, as you're going to work, as you're talking to that mean little kid at school, as you're, uh, as you're talking to your husband, as you're talking to your wife, as you're talking to your kids and your grandkids, as you're making stuff, as, you're, as you go along when you're at school with your friends, when you're in class, as you're going along in your life, as you travel through life, make disciples, preach the gospel, bear witness. Now, that doesn't preclude that you might be sent to China, but most of you obviously weren't sent to China because if you were, why are you in Toledo? Now, if you were sent to China, as you go, make disciples. But for the rest of you that weren't sent to China, as you go, make disciples. Here's what we do. We think, well, that applies to missionaries or that applies to everybody, but I'm not, gonna, I'm not probably going to do that. What this is really saying is, as you go along, share the gospel with people. It's just a part of your life. Share what, you know what you do when you're excited about something, sports or anything? You're excited about something, you talk about it. Whatever fills the heart comes out of the mouth. The, the, the heart is the well and the tongue is the bucket. You know, I think about my own life. When I was a brand new Christian, I can remember, I can remember this is how, this is how it was when I was a new Christian. I've been saved a couple weeks. I'm driving home and I pass a hitchhiker and I think, oh, I'm going to go back. I turn around, pick the guy up and I, and he's just come out of the, the Silver Star Tavern. It's late because I'm working nights and he's kind of wasted, right? And I get him in the car and I'm talking to him and we're driving about couple miles and I start talking to him but I didn't mean to I just started sharing the Lord with him that God had done in my life I dropped that guy off in three miles and he was stone cold sober by the time he got out of my car uh, what I'm telling you what is <laughs> what I'm telling you is nobody taught me that I just wanted to do it it was the overflow of my life what's up with us I thought I so then, then people started teaching me they said well you know, you got to force it. You got to do these, these, these campaigns and all this pressure. This happens to you when you get into ministry. You got to make it happen. I had stacks of books on training people, win schools, all this stuff. And it was all well intended. There were all strategic ways to close the deal. <laughs> Conferences on how to get people to do what they should do naturally. <laughs> and probably would do if we didn't make it so complicated. And what we end up doing a lot of times in our efforts to, quote, evangelize or to get people involved in witnessing or whatever, is we end up teaching people to ignore the very people they know and are around and that they would normally hang out with so they can rush off impatiently and witness to a stranger who's annoyed to see him in the first place. Now, if the Holy Spirit says for you to do something, you should. But the result of this kind of industrialized approach to transforming lives by the Holy Spirit results in almost nothing but irritation. I'll give you an example. One day I was driving. I'd been out visiting. And I'd been here a few years. And I was, I was really trying hard. I had a list. And I was, I, was, I, I was just not getting anything. I was just making people annoyed. But I was trying. So one day I was driving down the Layton Road out here east of town, and I had a, and I drove past this place, little place, and it was, I, I, the Holy Spirit just prompted me. It wasn't like a voice, but it was like, you need to go there. You need to stop there and, and, um, and, and go, to, go to that house. So I drove down the road, turned around, went back, pulled in. And I knocked on the door, and there was an older lady answered the door. And I could see out of the corner of my eye there was a hospital bed in the room. 
And I am, um, so they invited me in, which is a good sign. And I went in and the lady in the bed had cancer and she was not, she was going to die pretty soon. And she literally, not right before I got there, they'd been talking about spiritual things, even though they weren't believers. They wanted to know about it. So I walked in, I shared with this lady, probably half an hour, talked to her. She prays, turns her life over the Lord. Her sister turns her life over the Lord. Her other sister turns her life over the Lord. They're all older ladies. And there's another lady there who I hadn't met before, Kay Lyon. And Kay was a Christian, but hadn't been going to church for a while. So I was able to encourage her and help her. Then later I met Kim, and then we became friends and neighbors. I taught a Bible study at their house. And I can look back and maybe hundreds of people that indirectly or directly were connected with that one stop. And you know what it really was? It was just friendship. There was no plan. It was just friendship, just relationships that ended up getting built over time. Just friendship and sensitivity to God, sensitivity to the neighbors, to what their need was. But we make it so complicated and we force it. And in the end, we end up just not doing it or we feel guilty or we feel like we, we, feel like we have to make something happen. You know, um, we try to be something that we're really not. It was like me getting rid of, you know, I didn't bring it, bring it in here today, but when I first came here, I, got, I didn't get a, I, I thought, no, I can't, I can't use a, my wife got me a banjo and I didn't get a banjo. I took it back because I thought, oh, I, I don't need to, have, I'm a preacher now, I need to not be all into that banjo. Then within a couple of weeks, I get sent to Toledo I come in, everybody there looks like they want somebody to play the banjo. <laughs> oh. You know what I just want to say? Be who you are. Be the person God's made you to be. You're unique. You know, there's one thing about all of you here I can say. You are an absolutely, you are amazing at one thing that nobody else can do. And it is great. It's a good thing. Don't, 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 I'm not, this is not just like some kind of nonsense. There's one thing that you're really good at that nobody, you are the best at this that anybody in the world, and that's being yourself. That's being yourself. That's a good thing. Now, sometimes it takes us a while to figure out what that is because we've had so many people trying to get us to be one way or the other, we get kind of weirded out and we get kind of confused. But when you figure out who you really are, you know what? You are the best person on earth, the only person on earth who can be yourself. He doesn't want you to be a, a, a copy of anybody else. Be yourself and then, you know what witnessing is? Be yourself and let Christ move in you and you will be his witness without even trying. You'll just be a witness. You'll be weird. You're weird. You're strange. You're, you're a little different. This is great. And when you begin to share the hope that's in your life with people, the people you love, the people that God's put you around them, the people you work with, the people you go to school with, the people you live with, you will easily and naturally share with them. And you will be a friend. And you know, when you go today, you know, you're gonna go out of here. When you go today, you need to be, um, you don't need to like go to the restaurant and say, you know, just came from church. You know, I just want you to know my salad's got some brown spots on it. You're not getting a tip from me. Oh, but I'll give you a track here, honey. Go be a friend and talk about what matters most to you. You know, there's one last witness and then I'll be done. And this is a great witness that you are gonna get. You're already getting it. As a matter of fact, you're gonna get this witness to you over and over again. As a matter of fact, one day, and it's gonna happen pretty soon, I mean, way sooner than you think, you're gonna give this witness to the people around you. And you know what it is? The witness of death. 
The Bible says, in as much as it's appointed to a man once to die and after that comes judgment. You know what that means? There is one appointment that every single one of you is going to make it. It's death. You're going to die. I know, what a way to start a, what a way to, st- I don't think I make it on TV, comes up. You're going to die. Crank, I'm shutting that off. You guys are like drinking your like green stuff, you know, and like, I'm, try- I'm trying to fight it. I'm, I, I, I'm trying to, you know, keep the Grim Reaper at, at, at bay. You know, I got news for, I don't care how many vitamins you take, you know, what kind of special antioxidants you got, getting, taking care of those free radicals. I just want to just be honest with you, full disclosure here. You're a goner. <laughs> it's just a matter of time, okay? Now, what if, say, well, what if Jesus comes back? I know, I know, I know. I'm looking for the upper taker, not waiting for the undertaker. I know that whole story. But what I'm telling you is, the reality is, the reality is, unless Jesus comes back, that's it. And you know it's true. I did a funeral yesterday. I'm doing one on Wednesday. I'm doing one on Saturday. It's going to happen. But there's a witness from you when you can face death with confidence. There's a witness. And you know, Paul had that witness in his heart, and you can have it too. He said, in a cor- I, he said, according to my earnest expectation and hope that with all I will not be put to shame in anything but with all boldness, Christ even now as always will be exalted in my body. That means everything I do is going to give him glory, whether by life or by death. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. You can have that in your heart if you want it to. Now, some of you are like, you got all these other things you want to do and you experiences and you're all, you don't want to think about death game over. That doesn't sound, sound like that works for you. It's going to be over. You need to get here. As a matter of fact, Paul went on to say, for this reason, I also suffered these things, but I am not ashamed for I know whom I have believed. And I am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him against that day. Paul had assurance that he was a drop dead, go to heaven Christian. How about you? Are you a drop dead, go to heaven Christian? So I don't know, you know, I don't know. Paul had that witness within. Do you have the witness within that you're a drop dead, go to heaven Christian? If I die today, I'm going to be with Jesus. Bam! Absent from the body, present with the Lord. Do you have that certainty? Because you can. One time, I was, my wife was working at this place, and her boss and I were talking. He was outside smoking a cigarette, and I was out there talking to him. And he said, um, he said, well, you know, you can't know for sure if you're, gonna, if you're saved. You just can't know. I mean, it, you might think you are, but you can't know. And I had this little pocket New Testament. I pulled it out, and I read this verse to him, John, uh, 1 John 5, 13. These things have I written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know you have eternal life. He, he pauses and he looks at me. I hate it when you do that. <laughs> what I was saying to him was this. You can know. In your heart and in God's word. As a matter of fact, it says this is the confidence that we have before him that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. You know, it's his will for you to be saved. He'd have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. And you know, here's the thing. You can have that knowledge and that confidence that you're a drop dead, go to heaven Christian. And then you can go along and proclaim it as you go. Even today, you have a chance to proclaim your faith. As a matter of fact, the Lord's Supper is one of the ways that we proclaim our faith. This is a symbolic um, observance. Jesus gave it to us for a couple reasons. To cause us to remember what he's done for us so that we can have a heart of gratitude and humility knowing that the only reason we're, we're loved, the only reason we're saved and forgiven by God, it's not because you're so wonderful or you're better than anybody else or that somehow you know more of the Bible or you're smarter or better looking or, or better educated. No, you're saved because of what Jesus did on the cross. That's it. That's it. That's the only reason you have any relationship with God or ever will have any relationship with God is the cross. It never changes. You can't add to it. You can't take away from it. That's it. 
You're never going to get any better than anybody else or worse than anybody else. It takes the cross. We remember that. We have forgiveness. And so because we have forgiveness that is purely by his grace, we have access to God. We have fellowship with God. The, the door of fellowship with God swings on the hinges of forgiveness that comes through the cross. You can walk right in and come boldly before the throne of grace and receive mercy in, time of hell, in your time of need. But there's also another reason why we take the Lord's table. Yes, it's to thank him. Yes, it's to remember him. But it's also to proclaim him. He says this. The, he says, he goes on and he says, for I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you. This is the Apostle Paul. That the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed, he took bread. It's like a little bit of bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, this cup is a new covenant of my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you what? Proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. You know, when you take the Lord's Supper, what you're saying to yourself, to God and to others is, I believe it that Jesus did that for me. It's so great that I am completely forgiven. And I am freed because of that to have fellowship with God, both starting now and forever. And you proclaim it. Now, that, that's why you shouldn't take the Lord's Supper unless you really have assurance, unless you really have believed, unless you're really serious about it. You don't want to just make a joke out of it. It's not a snack. <laughs> you see, you can proclaim it. Do you have that confidence? Do you have the knowledge and confidence of knowing Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? You need to have that for yourself. You know, some of you sitting here, you aren't, eh, I'm not sure, I don't know. I know about it. I, I probably need to someday. Let me just tell you a little fact. Have you ever, let me ask you this. Have you ever, for yourself, ma'am, miss, sir, have you for yourself ever personally said to God, I'm turning from this sin. I know this mess in my life. I'm running my own life. Please forgive me. Be merciful on me, a sinner, Lord Jesus. I believe you died for me and rose from the grave. And would you take control of my life and be my Lord and Savior? If you've never, the words aren't important, but something like that. If you've never, have you ever said that? For yourself? Not your, you know, your mom said it for you. Your mom told you, you said it. But you know for yourself that you said it, and the witness of his grace, that confidence of being a drop-dead, go-to-heaven Christian is in your life. Is that fact in your life? Because if it isn't, you need to make it fact in your life today. You need to make it fact in your life today. And the only person that can make it fact is you. See, you can't share with other people what you don't have, and you can't proclaim what you don't know. And you, you, but you can ask him for assurance and you can confess him as your Lord and Savior. And you can let God do his part, but you have to do your part. You know, God is the only one that can save us. God does the saving and the filling and the comforting, and you do the turning, trusting, and believing. And you need to do that today. And then you know what you do? Then you just go through your life following that witness. You get baptized, sure. You have friendships. As you go, you bear witness. And one day you're going to die and you'll bear witness in your death too. That's how it works. That's what the simplicity of, of witness really is. Baptism, friendship, and dying. Dying well. <laughs> and you can do that. So this morning, I'm going to ask you, have you given your life to Christ? Are you, do you have assurance have you been making it too complicated? You've, you've created a little echo chamber where everybody, you just put yourself around people who never challenge you. Hey, look, you don't have to have all the answers for people. You don't have to live perfectly. You just have to live believably, honestly. So before we take the Lord's table today, maybe some, I'd like you to do this. Maybe as we get ready, take this card, would you please? This little lavender card. 
there was some confusion about whether it was lavender or violet. But anyway, and put your name on it, and a way we can contact you. You say, I don't want you contacting me. Okay, don't put your contact information on it, all right? Whatever, okay? I'm not, we're not selling it, okay? I'm just going to use it. If you want me to get a hold of you or somebody, we pray for you. We will. But here's some, res and you might have somebody you want us to pray for that you want to witness to, or somebody you're concerned about, or you want information about the church. But there's also a couple of responses to this message. Number one would be this, obviously. I want to trust Jesus and witness my faith through water baptism as soon as possible. Look, you need to do this. Once you give your life to Jesus, you need to quit messing around. Get on with it and do the next thing. And then when you get that done, there's the next thing. So get, follow him in baptism. That's important. We're going to have a baptism on the 14th and then one on Easter. And your name needs to be on it. And you say, well, I don't know about it. I don't understand what you guys do. You, you know, you might drown me. I've never drowned anybody. Honestly. And um, so... We will um, explain it all to you. We'll take the time. So you check that. Pray I will be a believable witness to my friends of the change Jesus makes. We will pray for you. You know, you say, well, I don't know if I've been, I don't know if I'm, I'm kind of, I'm kind of old to get baptized. You know, the first person I ever baptized in this church was Inez Grove. She was 77. And she lived out there on the, Hearst Road down on the bottom of that, that, that little farm down there by herself. And she gave her life to the Lord. She wanted to get baptized. She wanted to. And so I didn't know anything. I'd never baptized anybody. So I had her in the baptismal, and I re didn't realize until it had already started that the heater didn't work. It's just tap water. It's like 40 degrees. It was so cold. I was cold, and I had waders on. 77-year-old lady, didn't want to call it off. She comes down. I could tell immediately this was not going to go well for two reasons. One, I was green, and two, she was white as a ghost. And she just kind of turned into a, a frozen, the frozen chosen. <laughs> and I started to put her down. No, that's not the right term. <laughs> <laughs> I started to baptize her, and it must have, what do they call that, like a vagal reaction? It's like a, she threw a left hook, <laughs> and I barely ducked. I pulled back, and she missed me, and she hit this, like, this kind of wooden painting behind it, and it went, bam! And everybody there, all 20 of them, are looking out looking in at her, this big noise. And then guess what happened? As all good godly people, they started laughing their heads off. So I just pulled the curtains shut. Of course, the second baptism was even worse. That was right after her. It was cold. I didn't know she was afraid of water. Nobody told me that her mom had almost drowned when she was baptized years earlier. And she had a wig. What do I know about it? And it floated. <laughs> so I finally just had to just put her down in Jesus' name. She became a Presbyterian. Um, I would have too. As a matter of fact, I wanted to become a Presbyterian after that. <laughs> Anglican, you know, Lutheran, anything. Uh, but they weren't taking me after that episode. All I'm trying to tell you is, but you know, both of those ladies did that in spite of my terrible technique and otherwise and they went on and loved the Lord and lived for years and years and were great witnesses. Ines was an awesome lady wasn't she? She was such a neat lady and uh, so was the other lady went on as a great lady really good Presbyterian <laughs> and uh, that was on me but they tried you know what you can do it. You say well I'm not doing it after that I'm going to get a professional <laughs> I can't blame you, but we have had a little of experience, you know, maybe a thousand people since then. So, you know, I'd like you to um, hold on to this.